Hey, Squirrel Squad listeners, we're on Chapter 17 of Moods by Louisa. Louisa May Alcott. It's called Asleep and Awake. March winds were howling round the house. The clock was striking, too. The library lamp still burned, and Moore sat writing with an anxious face. Occasionally, he paused to look backward through the leaves of the book in which he wrote. Sometimes he sat with a suspended pen, thinking deeply, and once or twice he laid it down to press his hand over eyes more weary than the mind that compelled them to this late service. Returning to his work after one of these pauses, he was a little startled to see Sylvia standing on the threshold of the door. Rising hastily to ask if she were ill, he half stopped. He stopped half way across the room, for with a thrill of apprehension and surprise, he saw that she was asleep. Her eyes were open, fixed, and vacant. Her face reposeful, her breathing regular. Oh, Lord, is she going to talk in her sleep? Hope she does. <laughs> and every sense apparently wrapped in the profoundest unconsciousness. Fearful of awaking her too suddenly, Moore stood motionless, yet full of interest, for this was his first experience of sonambulism, and it, I guess that's a faint, bougie word for sleepwalking, and it was a strange, almost an awful sight to witness the blind obedience of the body to the soul that ruled it. For several minutes she remained where she first appeared, then as if the dream demanded action, she stooped and seemed to take some object from a chair beside the door, held it an instant, kissed it softly, and laid it down. I wonder if it's like that glove. Slowly and steadily she went across the room, avoiding all obstacles with the unerring instinct that often leads the sleepwalker through dangers that appall his waking eyes and sat down in the great chair he had left, leaned her cheek upon its arm and rested tranquilly for several minutes. Soon the dream disturbed her and lifting her head she bent forward as if addressing or caressing someone seated at her feet. Involuntarily her husband smiled for often when they were alone he sat there reading or talking to her while she played with his hair likening its brown ab abundance to young Milton's curling locks in the picture overhead. The smile had hardly risen when it was scared away, for Sylvia suddenly sprang up with both hands out, crying in a voice that rent the silence with its imploring energy, No, no, you must not speak, I will not hear you. Her own cry woke her. Consciousness and memory returned together, and her face whitened with a look of terror as her bewildered eyes showed her not Warwick, but her husband. This look, so full of fear yet so intelligent, startled more, more <laughs> than the apparition or the cry had done, for a conviction flashed into his mind that some unsuspected trouble had been burdening. Sylvia was now finding vent against her will. Anxious to possess himself of the truth and bent on doing so, he veiled his purpose for a time, letting his unchanged manner reassure and compose her. Dear child, don't look so lost and wild. You're quite safe and have only been wandering in your sleep. Why, Mrs. Macbeth, have you murdered someone that you go crying out in this uncanny way? frightening me as much as I seem to have frightened you. I have murdered sleep. What did I do? What did I say? She asked, trembling and shrinking as she dropped into her chair. Hoping to quiet her, he took his place on the footstool and told her what had passed. At first, she listened with a divided mind, for so strongly was she still impressed with the vividness of the dream. She half expected Warwick to rise like Banquo and claim the seat that a single occupancy seemed to have made his own. An expression of intense relief replaced that of fear when she had heard all. 
and she composed herself with the knowledge that her secret was still hers. For dreary bosom guest as it was, she had not yet resolved to end her trial. What set you walking, Sylvia? I recollect hearing the clock strike one and thinking I would come down to see what you were doing so late, but must have dropped off and carried out my design asleep. You see, I put on wrapper and slippers as I always do when I take nocturnal rambles awake. How pleasant the fire feels, and how cozy you look here. No wonder you like to stay and enjoy it. She leaned forward, warming her hands in unconscious imitation of Adam on the night which she had been recalling before she slept. Moore watched her with an increasing disquiet, for never had he seen her in a mood like this. She evaded his question, she averted her eyes, she half hid her face, and with a gesture that of late had grown habitual, seemed to try to hide her heart. Often had she baffled him, sometimes grieved him, but never before showed that she feared him. This wounded both his love and pride, and this fixed his resolution to wring from her an explanation of the changes which had passed over her within those winter months, for they had been many and mysterious. As if she feared silence, Sylvia spoke, soon spoke again. Why are you up so late? This is not the first time I've seen your lamp burning when I woke. What are you studying so deeply? My wife. Leaning on the arm of her chair, he looked up wistfully, tenderly, as if inviting confidence, suing for affection. The words, the look, smote Sylvia to the heart, but for the thought, I have not tried long enough, she would have uttered the confession that leaped to her lips. Once spoken, it would be too late for secret effort or success, and this man's happiest hopes would vanish in a breath. Knowing that his nature was almost as sensitively fastidious as a woman's, she also knew that the discovery of her love for Adam, innocent as it had been, self-denying as it tried to be, would forever mar the beauty of his wedded life. For more, no hour of it would seem sacred, no act, look, or word of hers entirely his own, nor any of the dear delights of home remained undarkened by the shadow of his friend. She could not speak yet, and turning her eyes to the fire, she asked, Why study me? Have you no better book? None that I love to read so well, or have such need to understand, because, though nearest and dearest as you are to me, I seem to know you less than any friend I have. I do not wish to wound you, dear, nor be exacting, but since we were married, you have grown more shy than ever, and the act which should have drawn us tenderly together seems to have estranged us. You never talk now of yourself or ask me to explain the working of that busy mind of yours, and lately you have sometimes shunned me as if solitude were pleasanter than my society. Is it, Sylvia? Sometimes I always like to be alone, you know. She answered as truly as she could, feeling that his love demanded every confidence but the one cruel one which would destroy its peace past help. I knew I had a most tenacious heart, but I hope it was not a selfish one, he sorrowfully said. Now I see that it is and deeply regret that my hopeful spirit my impatient love has brought disappointment to us both. I should have waited longer, should have been less confident of my own power to win you and never let you waste your life in vain endeavors to be happy when I was not all to you that you expected. I should not have consented to your wish to spend the winter here so much alone with me. I should have known that such a quiet home and studious companion could not have many charms for a young girl like you. Forgive me, I will do better, and this one-sided life of ours shall be changed. For while I have been supremely content, you have been miserable. It was impossible to deny it, and with a tearless sob she laid her arm around his neck her head on his shoulder, and mutely confessed the truth of what he said. 
The trouble deepened in his face, but he spoke out more cheerfully, belying that he found the secret sorrow, believing that he had found. Thank heaven nothing is past amending, and we will yet be happy. An entire change shall be made. You shall no longer devote yourself to me, but I to you. Will you go abroad and forget this dismal home until its rest grows inviting, Sylvia? No, Geoffrey, not yet. I'll learn to make the home pleasant. I'll work harder and leave no time for a new and discontent. I promise to make your happiness, and I can do it better here than anywhere. Let me try again. No, Sylvia, you work too hard already. You do everything with such vehem ve vehement vehemence. Vehemence. I can't say that. You wear out your body before your will is weary, and that brings melancholy. I'm very credulous, but when I see that acts belie words, I cease to believe. These months assure me that you're not happy. Have I found the secret thorn that frets you? She did not answer for truth she could not, and falsehood she would not give him. He rose, went walking to and fro, searching memory hard and conscious for any other cause, but found none, and saw only one way out of his bewilderment. He drew a chair before her, sat down, and looking at her with his masterful expression dominant in his face, asked briefly, Sylvia, have I been tyrannical, unjust, and unkind since you came to me? Oh, Geoffrey, too generous, too just, too tender. Have I claimed any rights but those you gave me and treated or demanded any sacrifices knowingly and willfully? Never. Now I do claim my right to know your heart. I do entreat and demand one thing, your confidence. Then she felt that the hour had come and tried to prepare to meet it as she should by remember that remembering that she had endeavor, endeavored prayerfully, desperately, despairingly to do her duty and had failed, Warwick was right. She could not forget him. There was such vitality in the man and in the sentiment he inspired. Now watch her get away from him, and Warwick's going to be married to, what's her name, Faith. Uh, doubt his memory with a power more potent than the visible presence of her husband. The knowledge of his love now undid the work. That ignorance had helped patience and pride to achieve before. The more she struggled to forget, the deeper, dearer grew the yearning that must be denied till months of fruitless effort convinced her that it was impossible to outlive a passion more indomitable than will or or penitence, or perseverance. Now she saw the wisdom of Adam's warning, and felt that he knew both his friend's heart and her own better than herself. Now she bitterly regretted that she had not spoken out when he was there to help her, and before the, last, before the least deceit had taken the dignity from sorrow. Nevertheless, though she trembled, she resolved, and while Moore spoke on, she made ready to atone for past silence by a perfect loyalty to truth. My wife, concealment is not generosity, for the heaviest trouble shared together could not, could not so take the sweetness from my life, the charm from home, or make me more miserable than this want of confidence. It's a double wrong because you not only mar my peace, but destroy your own by wasting health and happiness in vain endeavors to bear some grief alone. Your eye seldom meets mine now. Your words are measured, your actions cautious. Your innocent gaiety all gone. You hide your heart from me, hide your face. I seem to have lost the frank girl whom I married and found a melancholy woman who suffers silently till her honest nature rebels and brings her to confession in her sleep. There is no page of my life which I have not freely shown you. Do I not deserve an equal candor? Shall I not receive it? Yes. 
Sylvia, what stands between us? Adam Warwick. Earnest as a prayer, brief as a command, had been the question. Instantaneous was the reply. Sylvia knelt down before him, put back the veil that should never hide her from him any more, looked up into her husband's face without one shadow in her own, and steadily told all. The revelation was too utterly unexpected, too difficult of belief to be at once accepted or understood. More started at the name than leaned forward, breathless and intent, as if to seize the words before they left her lips. Words that recalled in incidents and acts dark and demeaning, no, unmeaning, till the spark of intelligence fired a long train of memories and enlightened him with terrible rapidity. Blinded by his own devotion, the knowledge of Adam's love and loss seemed gauges of his fidelity. The thought that he loved Sylvia never had occurred to him and seemed incredible even when her own lips told it. She had been right in fearing the effect this knowledge would have upon him. It stung his pride, wounded his heart, and forever marred his faith and love and friendship. As the truth broke over him, cold and bitter as billow as the billow of as a billow of the sea, she saw gathering in his face the still white grief and indignation of an outraged spirit, suffering with the, with all a woman's pain, with all a man's intensity of passion. His eye grew fiery and stern, the veins rose dark upon his forehead, the lines about the mouth showed hard and grim. The whole face altered terribly as she looked. Sylvia thanked heaven that Warwick was not there to feel the sudden atonement for an innocent offense which his right made might, which his friend might have exacted before this natural but unworthy temptation had passed. Now I have given all my confidence, though I may have broken both our hearts in doing it. I do not hope for pardon yet, but I am sure of pity. And I leave my fate in your hands, Geoffrey. What shall I do? Wait for me. And putting her away, more left the room. Suffering too much in mind to remember that she had a... Remembering that she had a body... Sylvia remained where she was, and leaning her head upon her hands, tried to recall what had passed, to nerve herself for what was to come. Her first sensation was one of unutterable relief. The long struggle was over. The haunting ca care was gone. There was nothing now to conceal. She might be herself again, and her spirit rose with something of its old el elasticity as the heavy burden was removed. A moment she enjoyed this hard-won freedom, that, and then the memory that the burden was not lost but laid on other shoulders filled her with an anguish too sharp to find vent in tears, too deeply to leave any hope of cure except her action. But how act? She had performed the duty so long, so vainly delayed, and when the first glow of satisfaction passed, found redoubled anxiety, regret, and pain before her. Clear and hard, the truth stood there, and no power of hers could recall the words that showed it to her, that showed it to her husband, could give them back the early blindness, or the later vicissitudes of hope and fear. In the long silence that filled the room, she had time to calm her per perturbation and comfort her remorse by the vague but helpful belief which seldom deserts sanguine spirits that something as yet unseen and uns unsuspected would appear to heal the breach, to show what was to be done and to make all happy in the end. Where more went, or how long he stayed, Sylvia never knew, but when at length he came, her first glance showed her that pride is as much to be dreaded as passion. 
No gold is without alloy, and now she saw the, the shadow of a nature which had seemed all sunshine. She knew he was very proud, but never thought to be the cause of its saddest manifestation, one which showed her that its presence could make the silent sorrow of a just and gentle man a harder trial to sustain than the hottest anger the bitterest reproach. Scarcely paler than when he went, there was no sign of violent emotion in his countenance. His eyes shone keen and dark, an anxious fold crossed his forehead, and a melancholy gravity replaced the cheerful serenity his face once wore. Wherein the alteration lay Sylvia could not tell, but over the whole man some subtle change had passed. The sudden frost which had blighted the tenderest affection of his life seemed to have left its chill behind. Robbing his manner of its cordial charm, his voice of its handsome ring, and giving him the look of one who sternly said, I must suffer, but it shall be, but it shall be alone. Cold and quiet, he stood regarding her with a strange expression as if endeavoring to realize the truth, and seeing her, not his wife, but Warwick's lover. Oppressed by the old fear and now augmented by a measureless regret, she could she could not only look up at him, feeling that her husband had become her judge, yet as she looked, she was conscious of a momentary wonder at the seeming transposition of character in the two so near and dear to her heart. Strong-hearted Warwick wept like any child, but accepted his disappointment without complain and bore it manfully. More from whom she would sooner have expected such demonstration grew stormy first than stern, as she once believed his friend would have done. She forgot that Moore's pain was the sharper, his wound the deeper, for the patient hope cherished so long the knowledge that he had never been, never could be loved as he loved. The sense of wrong that could not but burn even in the meekest heart at such a late discovery, such an entire loss. Sylvia spoke first, not audibly, but with a little gesture of supplication, a glance of sorrowful submission. He answered both, not by lamentation or reproach, but by just enough enough of his accustomed tenderness in touch and tone to make her tears break forth as he placed her in the ancient chair so often occupied together took the opposite one, and sweeping a clear space on the table between them, looked across it with the air of a man bent on seeing his way and following it at any cost. Now, Sylvia, I can listen as I should. Oh, Geoffrey, what can I say? Repeat all you have already told me. I only gathered one fact then. Now I want the circumstances, for I find this confession difficult of belief. Perhaps no sooner... <laughs> No sterner expiation could have been required of her than to sit there, face to face, eye to eye, and tell again that little history of thwarted love and fruitless endeavor. And excitement had given her the courage for the first confession. Now it was torture to carefully repeat what had been poured freely from her lips before. But she did it, glad to prove her penitence by any test he might apply. Tears often blinded her, uncontrollable emotion often arrested her. And more than once she turned on him a beseeching look, which acted as plainly as words, Must I go on? Intent on learning all, Moore was unconscious of the trial he imposed, unaware that the change in himself was the keenest reproach he could have made, and still with a persistency as gentle as inflexible, he pursued his purpose to the end. When great drops rolled down her cheeks, he dried them silently. When she paused, he waited 
till she calmed herself, and when she spoke, he listened with few interruptions, but a question now and then. Occasionally, a sudden flash of passionate pain swept across his face, as some phrase implying rather than expressing Warwick's love or Sylvia's longing escaped the narrator's lips when she described their parting on that very spot. His eye went from her to the hearth, her words seemed to make desolate with a glance she could never forget. Ah. Ah, oh, my nose itches. Could never forget. <laughs> never forget, but I forget. Okay. But when the last question was answered, the last appeal for pardon broken, brokenly uttered, nothing but the pale pride remained, and his voice was cold and quiet as, as his mind, M-I-E-N. Yes, it is this which has baffled and kept me groping in the dark so long, for I wholly trusted what I wholly loved. Alas, it was that very confidence that made my task seem so necessary and so hard. How often I longed to go to you with my great trouble as I used to do with lesser ones, but here you would suffer more than I, and having done the wrong, it was for me to pay the penalty. So like many other weak yet willing soul, I tried to keep you happy at all costs. One frank word before I married you would have spared us this. Could you have not foreseen the end and dared to speak it, Sylvia? I see it now, I did not then, else I would have spoken as freely as I speak tonight. I thought I had outlived my love for Adam. It seemed kind to spare you a knowledge that would disturb your friendship. So though I told the truth, I did not tell it all. I thought temptations came from without. I could withstand such, and I did, even when it wore Adam's shape. This temptation came so suddenly, seemed so harmless, generous, and just that I yielded to it, unconscious that, that it was one. Surely I deceived myself as cruelly as I did you, and God knows I have tried to atone for it when time taught me my fatal error. Poor child, it was too soon for you to play the perilous game of hearts. I should have known it and left you to the safe and simple joys of girlhood. Forgive me that I have kept you prisoner so long. Take off the fetter I put on and go, Sylvia. No, do not put me from you yet. Do not think I can hurt you so, and then be glad to leave you suffering alone. Look like your kind self if you can. Talk to me as you used to. Let me show you my heart and you will see how large a place you feel in it. Let me begin again, for now the secret is told, there is no fear to keep out love, and I can give my whole strength to learning the lesson you have tried so patiently to teach. You cannot, Sylvia. We are as much divorced as if judge and jury had decided the righteous but hard separation for us. You can never be a wife to me with an unconquerable affection in your heart. I can never be your husband while the shadow of a fear remains. I have all or nothing. Adam foretold this. He knew you best, and I should have followed the brave counsel he gave me long ago. Long ago. Oh, if he were only here to help us now. The desire broke from Sylvia's lips involuntarily as she turned for strength to the strong soul that loved her. But it was like wind to smoldering fire. A pang of jealousy wrung Moore's heart, and he spoke out with a flash of the eye that startled Sylvia more than the rapid change of voice and manner. Hush! Say anything of yourself or me, and I can bear it, but spare me the sound of Adam's name tonight. A man's nature is not forgiving like a woman's, and the best of us harbor impulses you know nothing of. 
If I am to lose wife, friend, and home, for God's sake, leave me my self-respect. All the coldness and prize, pride passed from Moore's face as the climax of his sorrow came. With an impetuous gesture, he threw his arms across the table and laid down his head in a, in a paroxysm of tearless suffering such as men only know. How Sylvia longed to speak, but what consolation could the tenderest words supply? She searched for some alleviating suggestion, some happier hope. None came. Her eye turned imploringly to the picture, pictured fates above her as if imploring them to aid her, but they looked back at her inexplorably dumb, and instinctively her thought passed beyond them to the ruler of all fates, asking the help which never is refused. No words embodied her appeal, no sound expressed it, only a voiceless cry from the depths of a contrite spirit owning its weakness, making known <clears throat> Making known its want, she prayed for submission, but her deeper need was seen. And when she asked for patience to endure, heaven sent her power to act, and out of this sharp trial brought her a, a, bit, a better strength and clearer knowledge of herself than years of smoother experience could have bestowed. A sense of security, of stability came to her as that entire reliance assured her by its all-sustaining power that she had found what she had most needed to make life clear to her and her duty sweet. And her duty sweet. With her face in her hand, she sat forgetful that she was not alone. As in that brief but precious moment she felt the exceeding comf comfort of a childlike faith in the one friend who, when we, are deserted, when we are deserted by all, even by ourselves, puts forth his hand and gathers us tenderly to himself. His, her husband's voice recalled her, and looking upon it she showed him such an earnest, patient countenance. It touched him like an unconscious rebuke. The first tears she had seen rose to his eyes. And all the old tenderness came back into his voice, softening the dismissal which had been more coldly begun. Dear, silence and rest are best for both of us tonight. We cannot treat this trouble as we should till we are calmer. Then we will take counsel how soonest to end what never should have been begun. Forgive me, pray for me, and in sleep forget me for, the, for a little while. He held the door for her, but as she passed, Sylvia lifted her face for the goodnight caress without which she never left him since, since she became his wife. She did not speak, but her eye humbly besought this token of forgiveness. Not forgiveness. Nor was it denied. Moore laid his hand upon her lips, saying, These are Adam's now, and kissed her on the forehead. Such a little thing, but it overcame Sylvia with the sorrowful certainty of the loss which had befallen both, and she crept away, feeling herself an exile from the heart and home whose happy mistress she never could be again. Moore watched the little figure going upward and weeping softly as it went, as if he echoed the sad never any more, which those tears expressed, and then it vanished with a backward look, shut himself in alone with his great sorrow. And that's all of 17. Oh my gosh! Yay! Now if Warwick hadn't messed up, like I said, I just know yes. Oh, but I still feel like they're going to get together. And I hope it's good. 
It's got to be good. <laughs> next chapter is called, chapter 18, what's next? For real. <laughs> got lots to show you today. Well, might not show it all today. Uh, I sort of went crazy at Michael's. Mm -hmm. I had some yarn I've been waiting on. <laughs> Hope to see you live at five. It won't be that long. A couple more hours and some minutes. Love ya. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.